on what is application centric because it's it means something different to everyone and so I want to kind of lay out what that means to to us um, talk a little about what a microservices infrastructure consists of uh, and then how do you enable microservices in the enterprise in a cloud environment and across multiple clouds and then introduce something that we call project shipped and then we can kind of wrap up um, after that with a few questions maybe and so from from a kind of intro side of it, as you've already heard, Cisco's building this thing called the InterCloud, which is sort of the internet of clouds, connecting all of these disparate lands and, and, and clouds that have been built and, and are being managed mo both locally and in, in the, the public or managed cloud space. And so this, this vision kind of makes me, as a, as a CTO, think about, well, what, how is this going to help solve business problems, right? And so the InterCloud vision is really building this big platform and is trying to offer Cisco as a service. And so when I think about those two things, you know, I immediately start wondering, well, how do I create a platform? What does a platform need? What are some of the characteristics of a platform? And when you think about delivering something as a service, what does that mean? Like, how do I create and manage something as a service? And so some of the characteristics that we'll talk about a little bit more later is like VM portability. How do I create a server or a set of services that are portable and they're not locked into one single location or one single um, distribution? When you think about um, you know, this model of application-centric policy, what does that mean? Like how do I create policies? How do I think about application policy? Um, we look at this ecosystem that Cisco is creating, how do partners fit into what we're doing and, and how should partners think about working with Cisco. And then obviously standards and being open, open source and open standards are a very key part of the Cisco strategy. So, so with that, what is application centric? So application centric, kind of going old school, right, giving you kind of a very basic, simple definition. Um, it's, it's really that developers have been and will continue to really drive the market, right? And developers aren't doing this because they're developers. Developers do this because the business has money and the business says, I need this out as quick as you can get it out. Go ship this fast. I don't care about how long it takes IT to do something. You go around IT if you have to, you get it done, right? And so it's all about being elastic, being at, at, at large scale and, at, and rapid prototyping, rapid deploy, fell fast type of technology. It's about flexibility, right? Every enterprise wants more flexibility with how they take their applications to the market. Um, and with that, they need reduced time to market. They can't spend months in design sessions and design reviews and trying to get firewall rules open and try to get policies changed to allow this application to talk to that service, right? And so it's a lot about just trying to really enable those application teams to run independently and, and loosely coupled. And then what surprises some people, as I put on at the end, is ruthlessly standardized, right? People think that DevOps is just kind of like the Wild West, but it's not. It's the exact opposite, right? When you're, when you're following a true DevOps methodology, you are so tied in to doing things the same secured method every single time that it flows every single time through this secure method and through this application control method that your code quality actually goes up and your security actually goes up. And so it becomes much more standardized than a lot of people think it will become. So then to kind of get a little bit more, you know, I guess radical, I talk about some of the business outcomes that have to do with application-centric. And so one is, I, is what I like to call services versus Legos. And I'm a Lego builder, so I know I, most of you guys in this room, are, being here at Cisco Live, are probably also Lego builders. And I, I know it's a lot of fun to kind of go off and build and define your application every single time and take all the different pieces you need from different components of the business and kind of stitch it together and have to like figure out new ways to solve the same problem every time you need to build something because something changed since the last time you built it. And so there's nothing wrong with Lego building, but I think what's happening with, with kind of application-centric methodology is move away from these Legos as having to rebuild them every time and instead take these, they take these Legos and make services that are highly composable and highly um, uncoupled from each other that allow you to kind of create a service much quicker because you have all the Lego components already stitched together underneath. 
and you're calling the same Lego blocks every time versus having to go off and try to build the Lego box every single time. The other um, interesting outcome is you want to have a product alignment versus project alignment. So if you're working on a project instead of a product, you're probably in the wrong sort of value chain because you want to be very much focused on delivering value at a product level, not at a project level. The third outcome is you fell fast, or you, a lot of people say fell forward, right? And some people get really upset with the term fell, but in, in today's industry, right, that's the way you want to be. You want to make the mistakes quickly because you don't want to spend nine months to get to a failed outcome. You'd rather spend two weeks to get to that failed outcome, make a pivot, and then the next two weeks you come out with a successful product. And so it's, it's all about time to market, time, time to failing, and getting all of that done as fast as you can. There are also organizational aspects that have to do with application-centric, and, and most of this has to do with sort of the way an application team um, functions is the way you want to try to mimic your organizational functions, right? And so we think about, you know, being very loosely coupled to your day-to-day -day job, being able to kind of do what is needed to get the job done, be able to pivot quickly, is sort of the way the business is looking at moving in the future, right? So we think about application-centric, you want to kind of take that to the extreme almost and look at how do you get your organization to, to operate in that manner. So you're not interrupt driven, but you're very much agile in how you do your day-to-day -day job and you're improving and constantly improving the orchestration and the automation aspects of your job so that you don't have to be in this interrupt driven world. And then the last one is every company is becoming a software company, right? And, and every industry is being disrupted by software disruption. So it's almost imperative to become more of an agile software development you know, methodology around your organization and around your product team because that's kind of what your, your competition is or will be doing to you. And so you want to kind of be ahead of that curve. When you think about you know, cloud, there's some practical examples that I think about with cloud. And, and the reason I, I bring these up is that cloud was sort of defined early on to be around orchestration and automation. And so when you think about what a cloud is trying to accomplish, it's trying to take what used to be a set of, of specific processes that had to be followed to provision a server, to provision a server, to connect the server to the network, to get the storage connected to the server, to get the network configured to allow the rules to allow the servers to talk to each other, get the load balancer set up, all of these processes that were manually assigned to someone to go off and provision, we kind of automated all of that. And the whole purpose of that was to make it easier for applications to integrate, to get the development started sooner, and so they could deploy much sooner. And there's sort of three types of, of use cases that are kind of um, interesting when you look at what's happened in the cloud. And so there's two extremes and there's kind of one in the middle. So on the on one hand extreme, you have a lot of enterprises that are taking new businesses and new um, applications completely cloud native. And in those use cases, they're doing everything in the cloud. They're starting their entire process in the cloud. They're um, kind of updating their internal processes and their internal um, approvals, kind of like you saw with Mitchell earlier in his talk. They're kind of updating all of that as part of that cloud deployment flow. The other extreme is kind of your legacy apps or your monolithic apps. And many of those apps are, are hard-coded and, and you know, things like the mainframe will never move into the cloud, right? Why would you? you know, it just it seems kind of dumb, right? Some database type of solutions may not ever work well in a fully distributed, highly scalable manner. And so in some cases you have like this legacy architecture that you want to sort of leave where it's at because there's no reason to go in and mess with it, right? Um, and then in the middle you kind of have what I call cloud valid. So there are some use cases that allow you to move some of these components of your application into a cloud environment. And those components are the ones you want to move into this application-centric model, but still you need to connect back into those back office systems or those other components that are inside that data center that maybe are going to stay in that legacy architecture. And at the same time, you may have cloud-native things that are going straight into the cloud, and you want to be able to connect that to the different services and different applications across that spectrum. And so the, the use case that I've seen that's very interesting is kind of combining all three of these with a, a big database that stays in the enterprise 
an app server that was kind of created and migrated into kind of a, a VMware-like cloud environment, and then a, a front-end interface that was completely de developed and deployed in Amazon. And kind of stitching all three of those together into a common user experience was what the main part of that project was about. Not, not deploying infrastructure, or managing infrastructure, but how do we create and stitch these services all together? So that's kind of the application-centric piece, right? What we mean by app-centric. Um, what is a microservice infrastructure, right? And so I kind of thought it'd be fun to look at, you know, a definition of microservices. Um, most people don't want to, are, are very afraid to define microservices. And so I thought I'd kind of be a little bit, you know, crazy here and define a microservice. And so it's, in my mind, it's a kind of a software architecture style. And so it's, it's not really anything to be afraid of if you're not familiar with microservices. Um, and the idea is kind of systems thinking, right? You take a very large, complex problem, and if you, uh, those of you that are engineers, what do you do? You break it into smaller components that you can deal with, right? And you take all of those different components, and you solve the individual component problem. You create interfaces between them, and then you kind of create a black box that says, OK, here's my service interface. I'm going to let these services talk to my service through these interfaces. That's all microservices is doing. It's taking what we've already been doing in systems engineering for years and applying that to application design. Um, the other idea, the other piece of microservices that's interesting is it's, it's how, how big or small do you make those microservices is an interesting discussion, right? And I could have a whole hour just on that piece of this, so I won't go there, but just, you know, the, the idea is that they're decoupled enough that if one component goes down, you don't take your entire application down, and you also have the ability to recover quickly because you weren't dependent on that application service that went down being the only service you have, right? Um, it's kind of SOA-ish as well, and so I, I, I don't like to use the word SOA in, in some, some audiences, but. You know, when you think about software-oriented architecture, it's kind of a, a way to create interfaces and, and abstractions around what you are trying to accomplish at the application tier. Um, and then the last thing is kind of looking at a quick comparison. And so on the, um, on the right-hand side is sort of the, the microservices approach, and on the left-hand side is, is kind of your monolithic application approach, right? And, and what you kind of have at the top is, you know, and this is something I borrow from Martin Fowler, if you guys know Martin. Um, but it's, it's sort of a, you have a single system that consists of a bunch of different processes that all have to reside within that system. And when you need to scale that system up, you have to copy all of those services and you have to clone that entire system and, and its state and replicate it multiple times. And then what you have is a bunch of independent systems all running together that you sort of stitch together across a load balancer sometimes. Sometimes you, they just fail, but you try to stitch them across the load balancer and you try to keep the state up. But it's every, you know, one system with, you know, five or six different components all running within that. If I have a memcache that is, you know, in that example, if I have a memcache that is getting um, to the point where it needs to be cloned or I need to, to scale out that mem class cache, I can't scale out just the mem cache. I have to scale, clone that entire system and replicate it just to get another mem cache. Right? And as you guys know, or maybe don't know, mem cache is a very small component of the application, right? And so to say that you have to clone an entire application, which could take 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how complex the, the application is, just to get additional mem cache makes no sense to anyone, right? Um, on the right-hand side, each of those systems, each of those services are independent. So memcache would maybe be that little yellow thing that looks like Africa, right, on the, on the map there. So it, it's that little orange component. If I need to scale out that, I just scale that out. I don't have to replicate the entire system just to scale out memcache. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, so when you think about architecture for microservices or advantages of microservices, the top of mind types of things, this isn't meant to be like an all-inclusive list, but for me, like scalability is one of the top things, right? Um, the other aspect is kind of going back again to system theory and system design, right? You want to have a kind of a self-healing, fault-tolerant type of a solution, right? And, and I, you know, every ideal cloud designer like me, my, my main goal is to have a self-healing system, right? And so, 
to me, I think microservices, one of the advantages is that promise that you could actually have a completely fault tolerant type of solution. Um, the other piece, as I kind of talked about with the example, is you don't have to replicate multiple large complex systems to get an additional piece of a service scaled out. You can just kind of take an individual service and deploy that. Um, the other piece from a developer standpoint is when you're writing code, trying to write a large monolithic application is very complex and very painful. And so being able to break that into a much smaller set of code that's self-contained and you can kind of unit test and, and vulnerability scan and, and do all of your sort of development around a small chunk of code, even if you have like 10 or 11 of these small chunks of code that you have to run across and manage, it's a lot easier than trying to put all of that into one large routine and try to manage that entire routine and test that entire routine if you need to change one simple line in, in, a, in one single service somewhere in that routine. The other thing that is interesting here is that this is just an architecture, so it's not about languages, right? And so whatever development language you're running in or developing in, it, it runs as a, you can run that language and still deploy as a microservice architecture. So you don't have to like, you don't have to, come, you don't have to learn a new language or leave the language that you like to develop in or that your company has picked to develop in. Um, so I think that has a, a, a large advantage. You can also independently develop and build and deploy each of these microservices in different life cycles. You don't, you're not, cons not constrained to one large SDLC pipeline that every single thing has to go into, and then you have to wait until you have cycles for everyone to test every single piece of their code before it spits you out on the other end two weeks or three weeks later, right? And so you can kind of independently build, develop, and test each of these. Um, which, of course, results in much faster iteration time. So you can fail fast or you can succeed fast. And then that also then gives you a much quicker way to adopt new technologies because the one thing that's consistent in our industry is change. And so you know that whatever we're talking about today in a year or two years, there's going to be something new and more cool that we're going to be wanting to talk about and do. And so if you've if you're loosely coupling your services in a, in a microservices architecture, you can unplug some component or service and plug in a new core service that you want to try out, and you haven't broken your end-to-end -end flow. You've just, just updated it or changed it to uh, take advantage of something that you're interested in or something that will help your business solve a problem. And so if you were here earlier, you saw Nilesh uh, who on my team is in the back there. Nilesh kind of went through some of these slides, so I won't spend you know, too much time here, but in case you won here, I did want to kind of cover this a little bit. So, um, it, within, our, within our Cisco Cloud team, we've been developing something called microservices infrastructure, and the, that name will hopefully change soon. I know we're, a lot of people in the room want to change the name. So we're looking at changing the name, but we're part of this community that you can see we have uh, 770 stars as of last night. Uh, we've had 60 forks, we have a lot of people watching us, and so, um, the idea with the architecture is to kind of have a control node and a resource node. Uh, the control node consists of you know, other open source projects that you probably are familiar with, things like Marathon, and um, you can see um, Collect D on there, and Console, some of the things that, the, that you heard Mitchell from, from HashiCorp up here talking about. And then the resource nodes are where sort of the apps are being deployed, right? And the control node kind of manages and, and helps ensure that the orchestration and the cross data centers, I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, capabilities expand across multiple clouds. But the resource nodes are sort of where the, the actual application containers are getting deployed and some of the, the things like networking, like you know, load balancing and, and um, things like DNS, some of those underlying components that are needed to get the application completely configured and working well kind of contained within that resource node. Um, and I kind of mentioned before the, because um, I kind of blew my surprise, but we've, you know, everyone can do single data center deployment, and so we've been able to kind of set it up so that you have a, you know, a couple of control nodes, the, the control nodes scale up automatically based on the resource nodes. But we also have been, you know, very proud to say that we can actually deploy this across multiple data centers. Our latest release 3.0 supports Amazon and Google Compute Engine, and so you can kind of look at leveraging, you know, OpenStack Clouds, Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, all from a single control um, center, all using console, so all using open source technology. Uh, none of this is proprietary to Cisco or sort of Cisco only. This is all part of an open source project, and so um, that's kind of interesting from my side of it, right? 
Uh, we didn't want to do something that kind of locked you in or constrained you to what Cisco wants to do. We want to kind of make this open from the beginning. Um, one of the examples that, that we talk about is sort of how you would deploy this, leveraging things like your, your namespaces for your deployments. It ties into like projects. We, um, I mentioned Spark earlier. We actually create, uh, uh, we don't, I, don't know if we, I don't think we create the Spark room today, but our plan is to create a Spark room for you as part of a deployment um, so that you can then invite other developers to collaborate with you as part of that development. Uh, my team uses a Spark Room for like support, and so if there's an issue, you know, I'll see a message come into a Spark Room. Hey, this service is not responding. Would somebody please check on, you know, Marathon? And then I'll have someone else on the team as a Marathon expert will log in and say, Yeah, I'm on it. I see this issue. Restarted. You're back up. And so it's you know real time collaboration and in a development context, which is really cool. Um, but you kind of create your project, and then you can you know. And I'll go through more details of this. You kind of create your project, and then you can deploy it into different environments. And today, you know, we, we this example kind of talks about you know a, a staging and a prod one and a prod two. But we also think about things like publishing this to the Cisco marketplace. So you could actually create your app, say publish to marketplace, and then we'll take you through the process, you know, automatically, kind of self-service of onboarding that application into the Cisco marketplace. And then we also have um, due to those different development environments or deployment environments could be leveraging something like OpenShift. So you might say, I've developed this, I want to deploy this using you know, an OpenShift PaaS, you know, the, the Kubernetes component, and we'll let you kind of select that as your deployment engine into any different environment that supports that app, that environment. So it's, it's pretty plug and play is sort of the idea. The, um, the way it kind of works, as you look at the underneath the infrastructure, we kind of register um, the, the Docker events, and we're kind of like monitoring those events. Um, we then kind of add the Docker instances. We then do um, we let console expose the information via DNS. Uh, then the, the templates watch um, the changes in console, and then HA proxy is updated based on those changes in console. And then the name uh, namespace naming convention. It's going to be, you know, kind of that environment dot project dot service and then dot ship dot com, which is the the name of our project shipped. That's kind of how the service discovery works. Um, and what's sort of interesting about this is, like I mentioned before, it's not just something we're doing. We're partnering with HashiCorp. We're partnering with Mesosphere. Uh, we're partnering with Red Hat OpenShift. And so we're. Um, I don't have an eyeball. I'm working with like Cloud Foundry and and others. So I mean, our our idea is to be very inclusive. We're not trying to build like a closed system in any way. Um, it's very much a focus on the application and developer-centric model that we talked about, application-centric model, um, very service design oriented. And it's, what we're trying to do is, you know, there's the ability for you to kind of try this out and contribute also to the project. So on GitHub, like I said, we have microservices infrastructure that you're happy to, to get involved with us on. Um, we also have in, on developer.cisco.com slash shipped. You can um, get more information about what Shipped is, and, and you get links to like the GitHub site and some of the other partner sites we have on there. Um, in the DevNet zone, um, on Pod One, you can kind of meet the team that's behind the microservices infrastructure and Project Shipped, and kind of talk with them about what they've done, how they've done it, ask whatever questions you want to ask of them. Um, we're hiring, so if you want to come work for me and, and be part of this excellent and awesome group, and you're welcome to come talk to me, and I'd be happy to take it to the next step. Uh, we also have um, some interesting things we're doing with networking for containers. As, as, as you think about the container space, uh, one of the gaps is around networking, and, and for some reason, Cisco is interested in trying to solve that problem. I don't know why, but you know, maybe somebody can tell me, but we're kind of looking at that problem. and then. Um, the policy piece will also, you know, instead of taking application policy and making it just a Cisco thing, we're working with the community again, both open source from, uh, from the OpenStack Congress perspective and also Tosca to kind of say, how do we make application policy kind of a standard terminology for application developers, not infrastructure guys like it is now, right, where you're defining ACLs and security groups, but more like, I want to define latency um, sensitivity, and I want to define, you know, my I/O sensitivity and SLAs around how I want my application to perform. And so, those are all areas you can definitely get involved, and we would like, we would welcome that involvement for sure. Um, 
So that's something about what is application, you know, what does application centric mean? What does microservices mean? Um, the next part of the, the talk is sort of how do you enable this, right? So, so let's say I've successfully convinced you that microservices is a good thing, that it's cool, you want to try it out. Um, so how do you do that, right? Well, it's not so easy, right? <laughs> so um, part of it goes back to what I mentioned before. Your organization is not structured in a way that lets you sort of try out cool and interesting microservice technology, right, in most cases. Um, there's also this, um, there's also processes and, and change controls, SDLC flows, ETLs, all these things you have to sort of live with then. And you're not going to be able to change all of that. So there's, there's some of those organizational issues. There's also process, right? A lot of process in most enterprises today. And so um, if, if, it, if it takes you weeks and weeks and weeks to get your, your day job up and running so you can test it, and if those prod environments, are, you know, your non-prod are so different than your prod, you know, you're basically you're spending all your time on your day job, it's going to be hard to really try something new, even if you think it's going to help you out, right? And so um, there's a lot of issues, as you can see here, that you run into in your day-to-day -day day job, right? Um, and there's also some software-defined challenges. And so what I mean by that is if you look at kind of the traditional life cycle, let's say you overcome the organizational and, and process issues, you now kind of look at when you're developing your, your software, you have to kind of pick a language. Or what, what are you going to develop this in? Um, what kind of stack do you want to use? What's going to be your back-end storage? When you go to build it, how do you connect this into your existing SDLC pipeline? Um, is there going to be additional bottlenecks when you do this because you're doing something new and, and so the security group doesn't know why you're doing it? Um, and there's also you know, things like packaging that, that cause all kinds of issues, right? How do you sort of manage the packaging of all this? And so you know, luckily there's you know, a vision here that we want to really get out there. And so we really want microservices to become everywhere and, and do everything that we can get to do. So we've been developing something to kind of help, help our customers and help our partners um, develop as you do today on your laptops, you don't have to change the way you develop. You don't have to change the way you like to work. You can build it uh, locally, and then you can deploy it anywhere. So there's not, we're trying to get rid of that lock-in and that no compromise type of, of standpoint. Um, it lets you work within your traditional CI, CD flow, and so you don't have to create a new flow or, or try to figure out how you work within your company's flow. You don't have to even let them know you've done something different, right? It just, it just flows natively through your, your existing flow. And with the um, packaging and the, and the versioning piece that we've kind of baked into it, it'll kind of help you solve a lot of those issues as well. The, the other thing is it's, it's so easy that when you, when you deploy it, and the service discovery piece and the automatic, that these, I mean, the, the service discovery piece is so slick that it, it's so easy to deploy. And it allows you to sort of get these services up and running quickly. They, they're available. You can start using them immediately. Um, and the last thing is it lets you sort of manage all of this from a single interface. So you don't have to kind of jump across and manage and log in in different interfaces. And this kind of goes to the um, sort of the multi-cloud standpoint, right? If you want to kind of leverage internal use cases and, and public cloud and maybe, you know, Cisco's inner cloud, you want to be able to connect to multiple different clouds. It's a world of clouds that we live in. You want to kind of have a, an application deployment methodology that lets you do that. And so with that, I want to introduce Project Shipped. And this is going to be a um, really great video that, that someone on my team um, put, put together for you. And so hopefully you enjoy this as much as I do. No sound. Retail companies and Amazon. All right, I'll start over again. Sorry, here we go will continue to be disrupted by software agility and innovation, now more than ever. Consider movie rental companies and Netflix, taxi companies and Uber, retail companies and Amazon. We conclude that every company is becoming a software company or will be disrupted by one. Currently, development teams have to build or integrate each component of this life cycle. This causes lots of delays and added complexity to each version of the application. Common pain points include application orchestration and service assurance, which are often difficult to integrate. This flow needs an upgrade. 
to be automated and integrated. Collaboration is becoming more and more critical to the software lifecycle, and modular DevOps tooling is required. What software-defined SDLC processes look like is more develop, build, and deploy. All of these tasks below are typically the developer's problem to solve. Many feel that DevOps is only for startups or 100% software-focused products. This leaves many developers feeling they are overworked already and that their boss does not get it. Innovation and acceleration everywhere in the business. This is the key. All enterprises are turning into software companies. The pace of change is also not decreasing, so it's better to adapt quickly to this new methodology than being left behind. However, to adapt DevOps, the challenges raised here need to be addressed. Flexibility is required. This framework is called hybrid DevOps. The result is no vendor or platform lock-in, and most importantly, no compromises. Shipped leverages the microservices infrastructure, open source project work, and the goal of hybrid DevOps is an easy to use experience, build, deploy, and run. Project Shipped is not just about Cisco, but is a movement on hybrid DevOps with best of breed partners like Red Hat, Mesosphere, and HashiCorp. Project Shift is only the beginning of the platform for the Internet of Everything. For more, see developer.cisco.com forward slash shift. All right. So hopefully that was as fun for you as it was for us to put together. And I want to kind of do a quick little demo. Um, this is the, um, the part where everyone on my team is going, oh no, he's going to do a demo live. What's wrong with him? And so we'll... Um, see if this works or not. I'm on the internet at least, so that's good. Um, and so let me go kind of back to, um, let me log out of this. And so this is sort of the, the interface for Shipped. Um, this is not at the developer's site. This is sort of the, um, <laughs> this is the, um, the, the Shipped-Cisco.com. So if you went to Shipped-Cisco.com, you'd get this site. Um, and what we've done to begin with is we kind of have this uh, sign up with GitHub. Before I go there, this is sort of the, um, the idea was, you know, looking at how do you build, deploy, and run. And so one of the things I kind of glossed over a little bit earlier in the presentation is that there are a lot of companies that have tools that help you kind of build something and deploy it. But then when it comes to actually running it, you're kind of on your own to figure out how do you manage this, how do you monitor it, how do you understand your application performance. Um, everything looks like a, a network problem if you're, you know, if you're an application developer, right? And so you kind of need better tooling. And so we've kind of, I'll show you some of the thoughts we have around giving better runtime visibility. Um, there's, there's a couple of, you know, pages on here to talk about what, what Shipped is. Um, it's an interesting view, but um, if you kind of sign up with GitHub and I have a, I'm not going to unauthenticate and reauthenticate, but I, I already have an account. It kind of drops me into my projects view and kind of shows me what projects I have. If I want to create like a new, um, a new project, um, you know, I can kind of call this uh, live demo. And it lets me kind of do what you sort of, this is what we kind of feel is the experience and we, we're still working on this, so love your feedback, but it kind of drops you into an environment where you can say, okay, how are you going to compose your app? And so. There's these four cate these categories across the top, develop, repositories, APIs, data stores, sorry, um, and message queues. And so from a develop standpoint, um, and just kind of give you a little bit of a preview, what, what this does is it kind of deploys a local development environment on your laptop, a virtual development environment. And so um, if you already are leveraging one of these um, languages, you would just select that language. You could then say, you know, build project, and it would create an environment on your local desktop that I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, there's also this concept that we don't have worked out yet, but um, and you can you can search and get like Docker Hub repos, but we want to basically have the ability to add private GitHub repos, public GitHub repos, um, other things like Docker Hub repos. Even I, I even want like CSV as one of the like I can select an actual code repository within my enterprise and add that to this, right? And so. That's the type of like direction we're heading with this with this platform. Um, from an API standpoint, like I mentioned before, in DevNet we have a lot of these um, learning labs, and so CMX has, has some APIs available to use 
and for you to learn how to like kind of program things around the CMX um, wireless access point stuff. We also have integrated to that same repository, and so anything that gets pushed into the Cisco DevNet repository for you to kind of write and play around with with your development capabilities, we expose through this interface. You can then connect to it as well through this interface. Um, there's, they're not available today, but what we're working on is bringing sort of your traditional data stores um, into this environment along with the, your traditional type of message queues. And so, um, as, as you can see, this is a live running system, so these things will be coming up as we get them up and running. Um, if I kind of go back to the APIs and just select CMX, um, it's going to ask me to kind of create a, a, a GitHub repository for the CMX project. And so if I you know, just kind of create some... Um, actually, I have to type this, so I'll just make it easy. I'll do a simple one. Um, and then I say go build project. What this does is it, come, it kind of goes off and starts this process of, of building a project for this application development that you're going to do on DMX, or what I call my project. So it gives me this, um, this window, and since I'm on a, on a Windows machine, I have to copy this into, um, into my shell. I always think I can shortcut that, but I can't, sorry. So this goes off and then it's going to kind of build that project locally on my, um, my laptop. Uh, you kind of see what it, it goes through a couple of steps. It, it starts by cloning the repositories that I need. And so if things are in Git, it kind of downloads them into my local, um, my local um, development environment. And, then gonna, and um, once it's done with that, it kind of downloads the configuration file that we create. Then it installs VirtualBox and then it's going to install Vagrant after that. And so, um, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a baking or like a cooking show, show at this point. Right? I don't want to kind of go through and bore you guys with all the command stuff. But over here on the back end, um, it's already went, I was already too slow, but it kind of has a nice little window that kind of steps up and shows you it going through the process of, of deploying all of that. And now it, at this point, it's ready for me. Once I write my code, I would just, you know, basically copy that into my window and then push, do that um, command, and it would take me into the next step. And so it's kind of going through this, this whole process here now. So it, it installed um, Vagrant, and it's um, bootstrapping the Sandbox VM right now. And so that's kind of the, the flow. If I go back to um, one of my other environments, like uh, CMX Dev, you can see where I kind of um, created this environment about an hour ago. Um, here's the, um, there's like kind of a, if I go to the deploy window, here's my build, here's my deploy environment. I could then, you know, build, uh, deploy the build to that environment. That's sort of the way the, the process would work. So if I click on this, it should start deploying. Um, it'll, it'll kind of come, run, show me the, it's going to fail in this case because of a dependency, but you know, it would, it would show me kind of the command line of what's being deployed and, and, and that type of information. And then when I come to run, which we don't have right now, but in the future, as I come to that run, it'll show me kind of where that service is running in the different locations or geographies or availability zones, whatever the, the terminology is that you would use when you do your deployment environments. You'd be able to kind of deploy it into those environments, and at that point, you'd be able to kind of see those services and the different individual services and their latency and their throughput and their availability all independently. So hopefully that gives you kind of a flavor for, um, for what we're trying to do. Um, from a conclusion standpoint, uh, you know, app-centric is, I think, a really important um, part of not just Cisco's strategy and vision, but I think it, in order for the kind of you guys to be ready for the software disruption that's happening, it's important for everyone to kind of think about application-centric um, design, application-centric philosophies. Um, I think the other thing is that composability and applications, you know, kind of taking your application, being able to compose it into smaller container sets, even if you don't call them containers. Um, again, it's not 
it's not really about the the containers or about the technology that is behind the containers, it's about really building these composable apps is really important and trying to look at how do you take advantage of these new technologies in a way that allows you to get your, your application to the market faster is the key. And then as we look at kind of building this platform for the Internet of Everything, um, we really feel like Project Ship that I just demoed is sort of that, that platform. It's that end-to-end -end user experience to allow you to sort of connect to the APIs that Cisco is creating, connect to the APIs that our partners are creating. I kind of mentioned before that we're looking at um, you know, publishing things to the marketplace, so everything that's in the Cisco marketplace will be, that has an API will be part of this experience as well. And so if, if one of the Cisco ISV partners publishes an app in the marketplace, you'd be able to take that API and, and leverage that to develop applications within that, this entire marketplace as well. Um, the, um, you know, I mentioned before, there's, there's some hands-on things in the, out here in the learning labs that are, I think, right over here to the left of us, or the right of you. Um, you can meet uh, my entire team, as I mentioned earlier. We're also giving away free GitHub and Bintray private repos, and so you want to make sure that you, like, you know, if you're interested in that, we're giving those away for free, so come on by and talk to us about that. Um, we are just right here. You can, there's on the map, it kind of shows you exactly where we're at, but the theater is, you know, kind of over here in front, and so the classrooms are back over there, so the cloud is, like, I can see it from here, but you guys probably can't, but it's right there. Um, there are some other sessions that we have going on um, for us this week, some breakout sessions that would be good to see. Um, this is just a subset of some of them. Um, definitely would you know, recommend you know, attending as many of these different sessions as you can. Um, the last thing I want to kind of mention is that, well, there's two more things. Uh, one is that there's um, theater sessions up here that you've, you've been part of today and yesterday, and there'll be some more tomorrow. And so you can see all the Thursday session down there. And then there's a lot of classroom instruction that we've been doing as well in the classroom over here. And um, you know, it'd be it'd be good if you're interested in some of the um, you know this multi data center control you know deployment stuff I talked about here. Then tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., the Elesh from my team will be in the classroom, kind of taking you through how do you deploy this, how do you do, you know how do you leverage this, how would you run it, and kind of take you through some use cases. And actually, if you want to deploy something, you'll be able to deploy something in that that classroom period along with um, uh, David from my team is doing some under the hood stuff at noon tomorrow and, and Jason Plank who I saw here in the audience is doing some how do you build enterprise apps on our cloud in, at 12.30 in the classroom. So definitely want to make sure you kind of attend some of these classroom instructions or some of the theater instructions and with that I will um, thank you very much. And thank you very open much, up Ken. for questions too. Thank you. Yeah, we, we'll take some questions for Ken.